Well then, Bunny, let's talk about books. You see, people always say, hey, Steve, how do you have such great story times? To which I say, it's important to look at your peers, look at what other people are doing for story time, look at what's popular in other stores and and, uh, libraries and, and schools, look to see what other celebrated storytellers are doing and then don't do any of that. It's important, I think, to focus on that. I My story times are really bizarre. It's on video. The last story time that I did, I, I started reading uh, Fire and Fury to the kids. Ah, nice. A good and choice. The kids are like, Ooh, and I'm like, come on, kids, this is a bestseller right now. You should be happy about this. <laughs> you should be happy that we even have copies. Everybody in the world wants a copy of this, kids. So then they'd be right. like, read this book. And so I pick up the book I'm supposed to read, and then it, I try really sly to put Fire and Fury in it. <laughs> okay, kids, we're going to be reading The Cat in the Hat now. Melania was at the table crying. (laughs) What, kids? This is the book. This is the book. So I'm very much not one of those. Oh, put on your listening ears. Let's all sit in a circle and and be quiet. I'm definitely not that. People also say, Write what you know. And what I know is that I have been a loyal and extremely scatterbrained, but also loyal uh-huh. employee at my local bookstore for over 17 years now. But I'm not that old because I started working there at the age of nine. Yes. So the math definitely checks out. When you got and, lost in the store and you had a, yeah. you had a, you had to live in, in, I don't know. In the stacks. I yeah. Live, is what we used to call them. The stacks. The stacks. And, and as such, I really do have my skeletal fingers on the pulse of the book world. And I am here, he said as he banged the table. I am here to rub my skeletal fingers all over your soul <laughs> with this week's spellbinding, pulse-pounding, excrement-rattling, intestine-melting episode of The Notes from the Bookstore. I almost said the Pope on film, but that's <laughs> the subcategory, so that would have been a mistake. Yeah. And this week's installment of Notes from the Bookstore is brought to you by American Craft Magazine. Uh-huh, Okay. American Craft Magazine. This is a magazine that, despite its name, is actually an art magazine and not a craft magazine. That always pissed me off. Because it's American Craft Magazine. But it doesn't go in the craft section with all the cross-stitch crap. No, it goes in the art section with all of our actual art. But then it shouldn't be called American Craft. But you know what? Whatever. And this month's all-new issue of American Craft Magazine features an in-depth article and a cover photo of an artist that you probably have never heard us mention here before on the Pope on Film Podcast. He's an artist, he's an activist, and he's an actor. And his name is, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Misha Collins. Mm. I'm pronouncing that name Doesn't- correctly doesn't strike a bell is he arabic i'm not sure i'm not sure what like aziz azaziz or zaza the name is misha yeah Yeah. who the fuck names their kids misha i don't know i don't know i mean don't some parents love their kids i mean i'm confused there maybe their parents were um big Beatles fans, but they also had a hearing problem. Yeah. So they heard the song Michelle and they're like, uh, I think this is close enough. <laughs> so then they, they would do that for other Beatles songs. So, you know, when it was Misha's birthday, they'd be singing 
do 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 you stay it's your birthday yeah do 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 it's my birth birthday too anyway yeah misha collins who knew i had no idea who this guy is no now he, this, he may be going places though maybe yeah. he might be I, I i've heard really great things about uh stonehenge apocalypse i'm sure that'll turn into a series we probably want to get into this whole uh Misha Collins bandwagon early. Yeah. 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 We're going to need to get on the ground floor of that. Mm -hmm. Now, this week on Notes from the Bookstore, we are going to do something a wee bit different. We're throwing away the script and the pre planned who's he, what's it's, and we're going to play a game. Okay. It's a vaguely work related game, too. I used to go to comic book stores back in the day. Yeah. Used to be a, a, a regular face in in comic book stores. Used to do that all the time, but not anymore. Having kids means making personal sacrifices, and comics were just something that I just couldn't afford anymore. Personal sacrifices and everything you hold dear to yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 when 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 uh when you have kids, then a lot of times you just give up who you are uh, as an individual in in order to further the collective. We're the Borg, basically. Mm-hmm. I, didn't, I didn't, I just came to that conclusion. Families are the Borg. <laughs> I, I agree. It's no about me. I am just like five of eight. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm two of seven. Two of seven. Yeah, I'm no longer Steve. I am two of seven. Resistance is futile or futile. There's different pronunciations of it. I I prefer futile. Most of the time on 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 the show, they go resistance is futile. But then I saw that movie Star Trek Nemesis and and frickin' no, not Star Trek Nemesis. First Contact. Yeah, and and at the end when uh freaking Data is it, doing in the Borg Queen, he says resistance is futile. Yeah, and then he like pulls the MacGuffin switch, the lever, and kills her. And so it's like, wait, I, it's always been futile. You can't just change it on me mid movie. Hey, he's Brett fucking Spiner. He'll do what he wants. I haven't seen him in anything in forever, and yet I bet he is a bit still like that, you know? Yeah. I bet he's just one of those people like, do you know who I am? I'm Brent fucking Spiner! Yeah. yeah. Although although I really wanted to see a whole series of movies based on his Independence Day character. Oh, uh, he, he, he's in the, he's he was in that reboot, too. He was? Okay. He was. He was in that reboot. <laughs> I think the only people that were in the reboot from the first one was uh, uh, him and then the president. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure. I haven't, so I haven't seen the reboot. I know. I'm so happy that that reboot bombed. Yeah. And that there probably won't be a bunch more. It, I'm really happy about that. Now, if only we can stop these Transformer movies. Yeah, see, I like the first Independence Day movie. I, I find it very charming. But, you know, no, I, I don't need any more. That was it. You know? Yeah. 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 It's ridiculous that now everything has to have a cinematic universe. Yeah. It's ridiculous. That's not a kitty cat. Someone drew a smiley face on that box. Everything is not a cat. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. And also, where are you getting these bubbles? No. So it's sort of like a dual thing. I'm sorry to burst your bubbles, but you shouldn't have bubbles anyway. You're like 18 months old. They're going to get just bubble juice everywhere. So now I don't get comic books. I wait for the trades. I'm a trade paperback guy. Yeah. Marvel's last big uh, storyline, Monsters Unleashed, sucked ass. Really? It was just really boring. And it, 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 well, most of the time when they have a big multi-comic book event, it's always, 
oh, this is a big event and it will reverberate throughout the entire Marvel Universe. This time it seemed like Marvel did, well, it's time for us to do one of these again. <laughs> yeah. What should this one be about? Monsters. All right, then. You know, it's definitely not Civil War. It's more of, I guess we got to do a Civil War type thing. Yeah. Anyway, our company, the company that I work for, the bookstore that I work for, they don't play favorites uh-huh. with comic book companies. Right. But our company is definitely under the misguided belief that DC is better than Marvel because they suck. I, I, that just sounds like a cry for help. We, 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 when we have sales, when we have sales at work, this is what happens. Uh, when we have a, a sale in the graphic novel section, they go, oh, hey, uh, uh, this month it's Marvel graphic novels. Buy two, get one free. Oh, okay. Well, uh, you know what? We better send each store maybe a couple more Marvels, a few, but not a lot. Yeah. You know, we don't want to oversaturate each store with a ton of Marvel comic books. And we'll just send them a couple, maybe a few of the majors, maybe a few more Civil Wars and a few more Spider-Mans and Guardians of the Galaxy. But that's about it. We don't need to go overboard. And then it's like, oh, hey, this month it's DC Comics, graphic DC comic graphic novels. Buy two, get one free. OK, here's box five of 11. The rest are in the truck. Okay. So we've got like pretty much every store has about three or four DC comics to every one Marvel comic. And it always pissed me off. And one day I realized it. I was in uh, uh, Sacramento. That was maybe like three years into my uh, career. And I'm like, wait a second. It, it seems like our store has a lot more DC and not a lot of Marvel. And people were like, oh, you're just saying that because you like Marvel. That's the only reason why you're saying that. You're just You're just projecting. So then on our corporate website, we have uh, we had a, a series a long time ago. I was still in California at the time, but we had a series meet the buyers. Oh, okay. and it was a look at it was a look at the corporate honchos out there who are in charge of buying products for our various sections. Here's the woman in charge of buying books for our uh, stores for their cookbook section here here's a lengthy interview with her here's the person who buys all of the fiction here's our fiction buyer here is our computer section buyer and today we're going to be looking at at the life of our graphic novel buyer and it's the tiniest office and this nerdy black dude yeah and he has no room in his tiny little office because every inch is covered with DC Comics memorabilia. Oh, busted. I pointed at this freaking article and I'm like, see, I freaking told you. Mm-hmm. I told you all and you scoffed at me. Ridiculous. And then we started actually carrying comic books in our magazine department. And I was really excited. I'm like, oh my God, we're getting these Marvel comics and these DC comics. But then we did it for a year. And then the the buyers just said, okay, we will no longer be carrying Marvel comics, just DC. Yeah. And I'm like, what? We're not carrying Marvel comics anymore? Why? Uh, we're not going to tell you, but we just aren't. So now we carry comics, but just DC comics. So of course nobody cares. Oh, do you have do you have a Batman issue uh, one thousand three hundred and twenty seven? I've been collecting these since they first came out in nineteen thirty nine. <laughs> Freaking ridiculous. Marvel characters are real people in real America with real problems. And DC, number one, has too many godlike characters. Yes. And basically, all the characters came from 1934, so it's difficult to, like, oh, no, it's the return of Fifi Le Trois. <laughs> and then all the comic book fans are like, oh, Fifi Le Trois, of course, from 1943. I'm like, what the fuck? I don't remember. Oh, you don't remember Fifi Latois? Yeah, he died in 1947, but he came back to life in Crisis on Multiple Earths 4 in 1989. Yeah. 
I'm like, there's no way I can follow this shit. There's no way. So I created a game and I've been trying to test it out on the entire family and nobody wants a fucking piece of this at all. Okay. The only person who played it was Amber and Amber had no clue what any of this was, but she did surprisingly good. Okay. So it's a game. We're going to be playing it now. Hold on a second. Uh, all right. Closing the door for maximum uh, maximum intent. So this is a game that I have created called Spider-Man Villain or Batman Villain. Uh-oh. Okay. I have 20 comic book villains. And you just need to tell me if it's a villain from Spider-Man's uh, rogues gallery or Batman's rogue gallery. It's difficult because some of the Batman villains are from 1939. Yeah. And then some of the Spider-Man villains, you go, okay, when did Spider-Man come along? Like 1960, 1965, something like that. That won't be that difficult. But there's a whole period in time around the 80s and 90s that is really difficult to pin down, you know? Okay. Spider-Man. But anyway, Spider-Man villain or Batman villain? Are you ready to play? I'm I'm ready. All right, let's do this thing. I've got 20 different names. Hey. I, I have a strategy. Okay, okay. Have I Just heard of this character? If the answer is yes, it's Spider-Man. Ah, okay. If the answer is no, okay. it's Batman. <laughs> two of Unless these. they were on the show. <laughs> um, two of these were from a movie. So I can tell you that. Okay, Okay. let's do this. Spider-Man villain or Batman villain. Number one, the Mad Monk. The Mad Monk. The Mad Monk. I'll go Batman. Correct. The Mad Monk is one of Batman's first villains. He's actually from 1939 and predates the Joker. Really? Okay. Yeah, the Mad Monk was battling Batman before uh, Joker was battling Batman. So good on you, mate, on that one. You got that one absolutely correct. That's that's before anybody found the Conrad Veet movie. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, number two, Gorilla Boss. Gorilla Boss. I, I gotta go Batman on that, too. Very good. Okay. Gorilla Boss is a Batman villain. Uh, Batman number 75, scientists, for no reason other than they're scientists. Yes. Uh, put a mobster's brain in a gorilla's body. Mm-hmm. So now he's the mobster boss gorilla. He's the gorilla boss. Uh, number three, Automatopia. This is a tricky one. Yeah, because it sounds vaguely familiar, but I'm still going Batman. Absolutely correct. Automatopia was a serial killer created by... Pause for dramatic effect. Kevin fucking Smith. Okay. That might have that might have been where I heard it, but at the same time, it had that that goofy Batman sixty nine vibe. Yeah. But originally, he was created as a villain for Green Arrow because Kevin Smith started writing Green Arrow during that period in time when people were like, nobody gives a shit about Green Arrow. Oh, Kevin Smith wants to give wants to write a comic book. Fuck it, have Green Arrow. Nobody cares anyway. Mm-hmm. Just but like Daredevil. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then in two thousand and eight, Automatopia started fighting uh, Batman and got really creepy. Uh, number four, sticks and stone. I'm going to say Spider-Man just because I haven't said Spider-Man and Spider-Man is due. 
You are absolutely correct. Sticks and Stone are mercenaries. Sticks is living cancer and Stone is the scientist. And they both became mercenaries. Very 80s. Very just 80s. Imagine, just imagine uh, bad guys in the 80s. So ridiculously Hulk Hogan muscular, way too many guns. Yeah. Yeah. The, that's a sticks and stone. Uh, number We are on number five now. Black Fox. Black Fox. DC was really into colors. I'm going to go Batman. See, that's why I chose that one, because it's tricky, because they loved calling black people black. Mm -hmm. But no, Black Fox is a jewel thief that Spider-Man fought in the 1980s. Oh, okay. Old white guy. Man, I really want to do the black cat, though. Yeah, oh, hell yeah. Uh, number six, the big man. The big man. Uh, yeah. Let's go Spider-Man. Absolutely correct. The big man was actually from Spider-Man issue number 10. He was a member of the Enforcers. Uh-huh. Specifically, specifically, he was the big one. Which may have been you why are, they gave him that. Yeah, you are reaching on the Spider Man. So, so so this is challenging. Yeah. Um number seven, Snowman. Oy, DC has a lot of cold people. Well, so does Marvel. tricky one yeah I'll, I'll go spider-man uh snowman was a half human half yeti from batman issue 337 from 1981 Ooh, that's like my first miss yeah uh no you also missed black fox oh black fox okay fuck yeah, black keeping fox. tracks um keeping tra yeah, I, 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 I was like, I was like, would he, would he have a Mister Freeze and a Snowman? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, number eight, Big Wheel. Big Wheel. Big Wheel. Batman. It sounds so much like a Batman. Like some guy in a big wheel sounds like like kooky 1940s, 1950s. But no, Big Wheel was a man who drove a large metal wheel from Amazing Spider-Man issue number 182. Okay. Molten Man. Molten Man sounds real familiar, so I'm going to go Spider-Man on that one. Absolutely correct. Molten Man was a molten metal man from Amazing Spider-Man number 28. So he was actually fairly uh, uh, soon in the Spider-Man universe. Number 10. Number 10. This is number 10. Uh -huh. The Ten-Eyed Man. I'll go Spider-Man on that one. No, uh, Ten-Eyed Man is from the 1970s. He fought Batman. He had eyes on each finger, but not on his face. Oh, 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 yep. you know, yeah. How do you reach for anything? Okay. So you, how do you so reach you, for the salt? Yeah. So like a dog, so, so a dog bites him in the hand and he goes, ah, my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Night man, number eleven, Kite Man, Batman. Yes, legendary Batman villain, basically uh, uh, the room of Batman villains. He's he's such a ridiculously stupid bad guy that number one, uh, he uh, his name, his actual name is Charles Brown. So he's Charlie Brown. Oh, okay. and he flies a giant kite. So if he wasn't ridiculous enough, 
And number two, he was so ridiculous that he was one of the no way this can be true bad guys that are mentioned in the beginning of the Lego Batman movie. <laughs> okay. Worth a Google. Okay. Yeah. Kite man and condiment king. And, and there's some guy shooting ketchup and mustard. And the pilot just goes, you made some of those up. Nope. They're all real. <laughs> Worth a Google. Yeah. Kite man. <laughs> Kite man recently got a gritty reboot in a fairly new series of uh, Batman stories called the war of jokes and riddles. And it's all about, it's a really interesting story. I really liked it. It, it has been, it had been a long time since I cared about Batman, yeah. but Batman recently asked Catwoman to marry him. And so they're going to be a couple, but then Batman, they had just done it and they're all naked and in bed. And then Batman just opens up his soul. If we are going to be married, if we're going to spend our lives together, then I need to tell you this one story I've never told anybody before. It's the story of the war of jokes and riddles. <laughs> okay. I thought it was going to be something about his college days. <laughs> no, no, it, it it's, it's a story of the first, it happens within the first year of Batman's existence. And, uh, the Riddler realizes like, Hey, Joker, you're really upset and you're not laughing anymore. And you're like struggling to find something that's funny. Meanwhile, I'm going crazy trying to figure out a way to stop Batman. And uh, I, I can solve any riddle. And so I realize that there's no way that we can both be villains separately without trying to kill each other. Eventually we will come to a head. So why don't we team up? And the Joker's like, well, I'm not happy. So fuck you. I'm, I just shot you. Okay. Cause I, the Joker is just not happy anymore. Nothing's funny. And he's just struggling to be the Joker. So they turn into half of the villains go with the Riddler and half of the villains go with the Joker. And there's this massive war and all these people are dying. Meanwhile, in the middle of it is just this lame ass, uh, criminal who is a henchman of the joker and he built like the joker mobile uh -huh. and he's bragging to all of his like is crime buddies. Bob? no no uh. it's uh it's uh it's uh charles it's it's charles brown and he's like he's bragging to his buddies his fellow henchmen yeah i helped build the joker mobile me and uh seven other guys in fact I, once we were done the joker killed everybody but left me to live I imagine that he let me live because he knew I could be an ally to him, an asset. I'm really somebody important to the Joker. And then eventually he calls and it's like, hey, Joker, it's me, uh, 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 Charles, remember? Charlie Brown? And he's like, oh, yeah, I let you live because you're fucking hilarious. <laughs> so uh, Charlie Brown becomes like the, the cog in the middle of this war and uh, Charlie Brown is helping the Joker because he knows that like, it, like, it, Hey, Charlie Brown, come and help me. If you don't, I'll kill you and your family. Yes. So then the Riddler's like, damn it. Uh, why is Why is this loser helping the Riddler? So the Riddler poisons Charlie Brown's son with it. And Ooh. it's the weirdest way he puts like a poisonous chemical on the string of a kite that the kid is flying. Okay. And so the kid dies and Charlie Brown goes insane and and that's why he becomes Kite Man. Anyway, the end of it is really interesting and it's just it's just the Joker, the Riddler and the Joker, the Riddler and Batman and they're fighting each other in a room and no one knows about this except for these three guys and they never told anybody about it. And the first person that one of them told is Batman right now telling it to Catwoman after they had sex. And so they're fighting each other and uh, they knock out Batman and they're fighting each other. And then the Riddler gets all pissed off, like, why aren't you laughing, Joker? And the Joker's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And the Riddler's like, what do you mean? What do you mean? What am I talking about? You should be laughing right now. I did all of this for you. And Batman's like, what are you talking about? And the Riddler says, oh, screw you. We could kill you at any time if we wanted. Did you think this was about you? This isn't about you. This was about me solving 
the hardest riddle in the world, which is what will make the Joker laugh again? Yeah. And all of this that I did, I did for you. I killed Charlie Brown's entire family. I had him help Batman uh, 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 turn on you and save the day. He f- he's flying a freaking kite. Charlie <laughs> Brown will defeat you, Joker. Charlie Brown helped save the day. This has to make you laugh. But the Joker's like, nothing will make me laugh. I'm going to kill you. And so they're fighting. And at that moment, Batman just fucking loses it. And he's like, oh, my God, he killed Kite Man's son. I was in the hospital when he died. And I can't believe this. And so Batman snaps and he's just like, "Okay, I'm going to kill the Riddler now. No okay. good guys, no bad guys. I'm going to get this knife and I'm going to stab it into the Riddler's neck and keep cutting until he is dead. I am going to kill now. So he, Batman stands up and he gets this knife and right as he goes to stab the Riddler, the Joker puts his hand in front of the knife and saves the Riddler's life. Uh Uh-huh, okay. And so the reason why no one ever told anyone this is that the Riddler almost died at the hands of Batman. So the Riddler doesn't want to tell anybody that. And Batman doesn't want to tell anybody that, yeah, no, I totally snapped and was going to kill someone. And the Joker doesn't tell anyone because I saved Batman's life. And that's what makes him start laughing again. Uh huh. It's a really good story. I was quite impressed with it. But yeah, the whole thing was basically just a gritty reboot of Kite Man. Oh man, how weird Kite is that? Man. Yeah. And I'm reading this comic book because it's supposed to be really good and it's supposed to be like an interesting story about the early days of Batman. And holy shit, is this Kite Man? <laughs> Oh my god, whenever I get the chance, I gotta tell Bunny about this fucking kite man. <laughs> so that was number eleven. I was gonna be really upset if you didn't get that right. Because okay. he was in he was in an ep- he was already in an episode of the Pope on film for Christ's sake. So now we are on number twelve, the kangaroo. The kangaroo. Yeah. Number twelve, the kangaroo. Spider Man. Yes, Spider-Man. The kangaroo is an Australian criminal with super leaping abilities. He's from Amazing Spider-Man number 81 in the 1970s, and he got a reboot in the Ultimate Universe. The kangaroo was the first criminal that the black Spider-Man, Miles Morales, fought. Uh Uh-huh. So, uh, kind of a big deal. Number 13, The Gibbon. The Gibbon! (laughs) Okay. The Gibbon. <laughs> Batman. <laughs> no, the Gibbon is a mutant with ape-like abilities who has a ridiculously long history in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. His Wikipedia page is freaking ridiculous. The yeah. Gibbon. Yeah, the Gibbon is a famous uh uh Marvel bad guy. Long history. They killed him and then they brought him back to life because, like, we have to. He's the fucking Gibbon. This is ridiculous. That's kind of hysterical. Uh, number 14, Gaggy. Gaggy. G A G G Y. Gaggy. Well, Spider Man hasn't been being my friend. Let's go, Batman. Absolutely correct. Gaggy is a circus midget who is occasionally referred to as Joker's Robin. Okay. <laughs> so like in like the the like 50s in like the 40s and 50s it was Scrappy Doo. Batman versus the Joker and Robin versus Gaggy the circus midget. <laughs> really ridiculous, but yeah, Gaggy, he was the Joker's Robin for a while. Number 15, Shathra. Shathra? Shathra. Like like you're taking a bath and you shat yourself. Shat. Spider-Man. Absolutely right. When you hear that name, 
then it comes as no surprise that Shathra was a lame early 2000s J. Michael Straczynski villain. Okay. That's a weird-ass period where J. Michael Straczynski was uh, doing Batman, and he went hard on the mythology and, and you know, the 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 all of that sort of crap, inventing a different supervillain every issue. And it's like, okay, you can calm your ass down. <laughs> uh, number 16, The Firefly. I could go Spider-Man on that. The Firefly was a film special effects man who used lighting effects and optical illusions to fight Batman. Batman, yeah, because that's Mysterio, too. Yeah, yeah, that's basically, basically. Mysterio. Yeah. So I was close. I get a half of that. His story is like he robbed a place. He was an ex, like a Hollywood guy, and then he robbed a place. And then Batman tried to stop robbery but as he was as he was running away batman saw an actual firefly fly in the opposite direction and said that must be where the bad guy went and goes to follow the firefly and then this guy goes really is batman just that gullible well shit i'm gonna (laughs) use uh trick lighting to defeat batman apparently so uh, we're nearing the end. Uh, number seventeen, Calendar Man. Calendar Man. That definitely sounds Batman. Absolutely right. He was also in the Lego Batman movie, so I would have been upset. Okay. Uh, his first appearance was Detective Comics number two hundred and fifty nine in nineteen fifty eight. All of his crimes centered around holidays. That's why they called him Calendar Man. He has since gotten a gritty reboot as a serial killer, but I think everyone has in the DC comic universe, as far as I can tell. (laughs) Number 18, The Foreigner. The Foreigner. (laughs) The Foreigner. Spider-Man. Absolutely correct. Web of Spider-Man, number 15. He's an assassin, and literally, it just looks like... There's no way they could have done this, because I think it's late 70s, early 80s, but it looks like they just cut and pasted the Punisher, but gave him a different color scheme. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but the Foreigner is just... It's it's the Punisher, but with more yellow. <laughs> okay. No, no white go-go boots. No. Hmm. Stegron, the dinosaur man. I could go Spider-Man on that. Absolutely correct. His first appearance was a Spider-Man Marvel team up issue number 19. He was a shield scientist who for fuck knows why decided to use dinosaur DNA and do a Kurt Connors. Uh Uh-huh. So that's but, how he but he became. has both his arms. Yeah, 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 but he has both his arms. So that's how he became Stegron the Dinosaur Man. And number 20, the the last one, Hush. I'm going to give that to Batman. Absolutely right. Hush is Bruce Wayne's childhood friend who holds a grudge against Batman. That was a great miniseries with Batman in 2003. Uh, It was so good. Uh, Natasha and I were both reading that. We were just in love with it. You got 14 right out of 20. That is pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, not bad, not good, not great. Pretty good. You did good. Pretty good. You did good. That was a fun game. Yes, it was. Like that. And that is it from Notes from the Bookstore this week. That was fun, right? That was fun, yeah. Heartwarming stuff right there. (laughs) And remember, boys and girls and gender, all of the above, you too can save 10% on all of your purchases. And all you have to do is get my freaking 18-month-old to say thank you. She can say please. No problem. Peace. 
It's like, okay, here you go. Say thank you. No. <laughs> Eleanor, say thank you. No. Say please, please. Say thank you. No. <laughs> she won't do it. She won't do it. There's a block there. I don't know. It might be an engram. I have no idea. It might be. <laughs>